Hello, it's Dr. Ken Meyer here. I want to introduce you to imagination and the learning of electrical physics. Electrical physics is hard to learn, very hard to learn. But have you ever thought why? I have, and I've put over four years of research into the problem, and I've come up with that how and why that can help. After all, this is science. It may not be rocket science, but it is deep, complex branch of science. It is firstly subatomic, that is not dealing with atoms, but rather parts of atoms called electrons. Some are tightly bound to the nucleus of an atom, making them good insulators. Others are loosely bound, and they are good conductors. And just when you think you've got your head around all of that, there are semiconductors. Semiconductors which are insulators and conductors all at the same time. Now, as we make the electrons flow, that is, jump between the atoms, electrical current, we discover that this flow actually has two dimensions and three attributes. The two dimensions are direct current and alternating current. Each of the current types has these attributes of magnitude, direction and rotation. I did tell you it was deep and complex branch of physics. But on top of all of this, there is another problem. You can't directly sense electricity with your body. This is one of the main reasons that the useful discovery of electricity only came about about 100 years ago. So you can't see, hear, smell, taste or feel electricity. I can hear some of you saying, hang on a moment. I can see lightning, that's electricity. Or I can feel electricity if I put my finger in a power outlet. So let me explain. Seeing electricity via lightning. No, you're actually seeing lightning as electricity ionizes the atmosphere. As that happens, large amounts of photons or light are produced. You see the light, not the electricity, which is the flow of electrons through the air. Hearing electricity via corona or around high voltage equipment like transformers, you will often hear a high frequency crackle sound. This is electrical energy discharging into the air. It's called corona. As electricity at very high voltages but very low currents flow into the air, sound waves are produced and this is the crackle that you hear. So you hear the corona but not the flow of electrons. Smelling electricity via ozone. When electrical fault occurs, there is an associated funny kind of smell, a musty type of smell. This funny smell is ozone or O3. Ozone is produced when air is heated up, causing oxygen atoms to combine together, three atoms at a time, which combine to form that funny gas called ozone. So again, you smell the result of the electrical current, not the actual electrical current. Tasting electricity via a tingle on your tongue. You may have experienced testing a 1.5 volt battery on your tongue. The tingle sensation is a very small amount of direct current disturbing your bioelectrical system. You're not actually tasting electricity. Rather, it is your bioelectrical nervous system that was created to detect chemical reactions, flavours, being distorted. And the tingle sensation is this result. Feeling electricity using your hand, as with tasting your hand, and your entire body by the way, is endowed with bioelectrical nervous system that was designed to feel pressure and heat. If you touch voltages above about 60 volts, the amount of current that flows into your nervous system causes not feeling, but actually the current causes extreme pain. You don't feel the current flow. So to summarize, we can't directly sense with our body's electricity. 
we're always dealing with this energy form in a secondary, tertiary or even quadrinary way. The result is electrical energy is real stuff, but for us humans, it's an abstract energy form. So, all this begs a question. How are we to use and manage an energy source we can't directly sense? The answer is, when science gets abstract, we create and use modelling systems to represent what the physics is doing. Now, a note of warning here. The modelling systems are just that. Models, not the actual physics. Many students get this confused and become very adept at using the modelling without ever really understanding the physics that is represented. Modelling system one is mathematics. In electrical physics, we use a lot of algebra, trigonometry, Pythagoras' theorem, and complex geometry. Modelling system two is the use of diagrams. We use circuit diagrams, connection diagrams, and all their associated symbols. But maths and diagrams are also abstractions. And they use abstractions within themselves, e.g. the symbols or letters in algebra are abstractions. Also the symbols that are used in diagrams are abstractions. So the complexity is building because the physics is abstract, the modelling system is abstract and it uses abstractions. So we keep moving away from the actual physics and we often lose sight of the reality of what the electricity itself is. How and what can we do to help? Well, there is lots we can do. The basic idea is that if you expand your God-given imagination skills, this will improve your abstraction skills, which in turn improves your mental modeling. It is a strong mental modeling skill that will assist with all aspects of electrical physics. So let's look in detail about how you can go about recognizing these skills, amplifying the skills, and maybe overcoming some of the blockages of these skills. The first step is to recognize that imagination skills exist and can be used to assist in the learning of abstract concepts like electricity. In my PhD studies, I created 10 categories of imagination skills. From this, I have developed Dr. Ken's Cognitive Toolbox. This is 17 abstraction skills, all built around the central tenet of imagination. And there's a website called wiredforimagination.com, spelled W-I-R-E-D, the number 4, I-M-A-G-I-N-A-T-I-O-N.com. The second step is to recognize in our Western culture, imagination is played down in the academics of science. I like to use a couple of children's books to demonstrate these stories like Peter Plan and When Henry Caught Imaginitis. Both of these books clearly teach that imagination is only for children's play and must be left behind in adulthood. This is simply a lie. It is this lie that makes the use of imagination and abstraction skills seem wrong to many electrical students. But they are invaluable. Once we have a few imagination skills under our belts, it's time to improve our abstraction skills in the form of modeling systems. This is maths and diagrams. This is a little like chicken and egg, that is, which comes first. The actual answer is both. So let me explain. As I explained earlier, it is sometimes hard to separate the maths from the physics, so we need to do a little of both together. You can't learn the physics without learning some of the maths, and you can't apply the maths without an understanding of some of the physics. The solution is to take a few learning risks and just remember a concept or some of the concepts until they join together and make sense. When that happens, learning has happened. The next big step is mental modeling. There is no right mental model. 
The mental models will be different for each person, but there are some basics to keep in mind. One, be prepared to always adjust your model. This is often difficult for adults. We like to think that we've got something down pat and we don't need to change. Two, build models that represent the physics, not the mathematics. Three, use analogy, but be aware of the limitations. For example, we often use the analogy of water flow for DC current, but it has limits. Use metaphor, like visualizing electrons bouncing between atoms. Five, practice. Nothing beats simply practicing, particularly problem solving that uses diagrams. Diagrams, their use, their application are one of the best ways to help build great mental models. Strong mental modeling skills that are built up around the physics itself are what is required to handle the deep complexity of electrical physics.